thank you very much. I have a question for all of you. Um, I'm teaching undergraduates at uh, Steinhardt School of Media, Education, and Culture at NYU. Obviously, they didn't have digital humanities majors when you guys were in school, I don't think so. So I would wanted to know if you could each tell us where you came from <laughs> and, and uh, maybe suggest what kind of education people who wanted to move into this field should pursue. Michael? I'll, I'll start. Is this web people good mic to use? Yes? We happy? Um, uh, I'm, have a, I'm a classic liberal arts guy. Uh, uh, I started my work at the Smithsonian 22 years ago cleaning plexiglass cases in the basement of the Asian Art Museums at a time when that particular part of the Smithsonian had been focused on bricks and mortar projects for a decade. And there's a whole generation of us who started doing, who were doing other things, some of them quite expertly, when the internet got really, really interesting. Um, and that's not, you know, there was no formal training. The job I have now did not exist 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, yeah. And, and, and I think underlying all of everything I said about change and society and is this idea that we're gonna to have to constantly be learning how to... How to Do you have any specific thing about where your education or training came from or just sort of all on the job as you built your career? Totally, totally solving, trying to stay not even one page ahead, but one you know, moment ahead of the very next problem I had to solve for a long time. Um, and a lot of us are very inspired by, as I think Neil referred to it, the openness and generosity of the open knowledge community. Uh, that drew, it drew us all in, I think. It's a very giving and self-learning group of people. Next. Uh, me, I had an incredibly conventional <laughs> background until I was 33. Uh, and uh, I'm in no sense a digital native and, 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 and still I'm not. But then in January of 1999, a guy dropped a book on my desk called The Archimedes Palimpsest, uh, which you couldn't read without using digital stuff. And uh, all I had to do was to find the best people in the world to help me. And it was very easy. I just said, I've got unread Archimedes text. Will you help me? And they said, yes, and I could just go to anywhere. And I learned about data uh, from an awful lot of people. Uh, I would particularly call out uh, Carl Malamud. Follow at Carl Malamud if you want to break data, people. And, um, and then, uh, then I met Mike Edson. <laughs> and then I met other people uh, of like mind. Um, and... Uh, so that's what happened to me. But there is nothing in my background to say why I got into this. I would say that I, one of the things about one of the about things about DH is sort of the um, inquiring nature of it. And I came. I came. I, I don't come to many things with humility, but I came to DH with humility. <laughs> I knew that I. I knew that I had none of the answers. And I knew that the thing to do was to ask other people. Anglo-Saxon illuminated manuscripts made in Canterbury <laughs> Cathedral in about the year 1023, normally the month of September. <laughs> I think my advice, uh, I'm a very hands-on learner. So again, I'm also a, uh, a liberal arts guy as well, and I, my, uh, my undergraduate degree was in political science. But I was very interested in nonprofit management in the arts, and it was working for an organization in Seattle in um, the 90s where I networked the organization, got us on to the internet, and figured out what the web was. And then I did an internship where I built websites for artists that um, had e-commerce components so they could sell their work online. And, and it was all project-based. I did a volunteer project at the Seattle Public Library to build a resource website for artists. So I think the thing is, you know, especially with uh, digital natives, 
is not being scared of learning tools, uh, trying things out. I think what, again, being a hands-on learner is that if you, if you encourage your students to work on projects um, outside of the school environment where they work with different types of, of people that have different skill sets, because I think having the, the ability to communicate and work with a diversity of people on technology projects is very key. Um, and uh, that I think you can only get from hands-on experience. So that would be kind of my advice and, and what's worked for me. I have a background in art history. I came to the Met um, as a long-term or long -term intern to work on prints that were made during the Federal Art Project, the WPA, and uh, I worked in several other museums before at the uh, Miami University Art Museum where I went to undergraduate school the Akron Art Museum in Akron, Ohio, and then the Met, and had a lot of experience in digital capture projects and TMS, and I created around 2,000 TMS records myself for the museum as an intern. So I was really familiar with working through these systems and knew how they related to the collection, was able to see those relationships across the museum and across the Met's content specifically. I'm from Yeshiva University Museum, and we have a collection that includes second half of the 20th century art, books, etc. How would you propose that we make these available without infringing on copyright issues? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what's the, I'm into that one. What's the collection again? Yeshiva University Museum. Okay, and what's the, what's, what are the, the corpus of objects? We have fine art that has been created by artists and copyrighted. We have art books that have been created by artists and copyrighted. And sometimes that have not specifically been copyrighted, but that fall within the copyright laws. And is there a particular problem you would like to solve? Somebody's, you know the, the famous book, Who Moved My Cheese? Is someone's cheese you want to move by making these things accessible? You're saying that we should be getting these things out there in high-res images, sharing and making available, which I'm not questioning, but what's our legal department going to say? And saying, where's my cheese isn't gonna help. So, so of all the things that you could, so basically it's a question about what do we do when the stuff is under copyright? Correct. And uh, my answer, the, the refrain all the time in general counsel's office is when copyright is complicated, it's complicated, but when it's not, it's not. So if you've got stuff that's encumbered by copyright and it's too much labor to go and renegotiate the copyright or to seek fair use exempt, you know, fair use exemptions, that's a whole long conversation, um, uh, or to recreate some of those assets so that they can be used in useful parts or just to create metadata around them so people on the outside know what they are and that you have them in person or to facilitate in person, all those things are off the table, fine. Find something else to do, but, but do it. But you, you know. think it might be possible to do high-res images and to make them available like this? It, in the abstract, it's hard to tell, but a little pushing might reveal a better <laughs> answer. Thank you. And I, and I would say two things. One is there's a very good reason why I'm a medievalist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody's dead. But the... Um, but the other thing is really look into fair use uh, and push the boundaries of fair use. Uh, because you can, you can do a lot with fair can use. use it afterward. You know, we may be making it available from our collection, but then the next person who publishes it in his book or something else, if the artist questions it. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think we, I, I think if we get back bogged down in copyright law, uh, we're probably in trouble because no, I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But you're responsible for, you're responsible primarily for what you do. And you can look into the fair use of, your, of, of those images. And uh, as long as you follow fair use guidelines, um, you, you, can, you can give people a very good sense of what it is that you have. We are making them available in small images, just not high quality. I think that you can probably do high quality. You have to look into it. Well, you can't do the entire book, but you can do selections from them. Right. And you can do them in very high resolution. You, you just say that you're trying to illustrate a point that needs high resolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, it occurs to me, Artstore uh, is, a, is a site licensing model. Right. 
and some uh, copyright holders are happy having things distributed to thousands of university students on campus with ArtStore who may not be happy with open uh, huh. licensing. Okay. So that's another way. Just And it how you navigate those choices comes down to what outcomes you're seeking. Thank you. C could I just answer this a little? I've, David Green, I've worked a lot on this issue. Uh, I'd just like to say that, no, you cannot put copy full resolution copyright uh, copyrighted works online without getting permission. If you, you really should um, fight hard to get permission. If you can't get permission, you can't do it. Um, thumbnails, you can get away with thumbnails, but, but anything beyond a thumbnail, you really have to get permission. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum is a fabulous example of an organization that's really worked hard, has a great system for getting stuff up. I mean, it's a huge subject, but N no, you cannot put high-resolution work up online without getting permission. It's, uh, I mean, I'm a strong advocate for fair use, but you know, fair use has its place. Thank you. That's another lesson in humility for me. <laughs> I think another perspective that I wanted to share as well is to talk about people that are creating content now. If you're making digital art now, if you're publishing now, if you're creating things in a digital culture, use a CC license. It's available to you, it's out there, and you're doing your future generations of museum lovers and literature fans a huge favor by creating a massive body of information right now that we can use in the future, and use now too. So I know somebody who works in a muse uh, large museum here in New York, and after I went to the previous digital humanities things at New York Public Library, I, I went to him and said, oh, all these great things happening in museums. Uh, you were there, Neil. And I said, are you involved in this? And he said, well, who's involved in it? So I mentioned your name, and he didn't know who it was. I, you know, I, tr I was trying to explain the kind of department. And he then responded, oh, they all work in their own area. We do our own thing. Um, you all come from big organizations. How do you deal with that? I mean, that's a different kind of digital divide. It's not that they don't have it. It's that they aggressively are not interested in it. How do you deal with that with all your organizations? Christina, could you speak to that about working with multiple institutions? Yes. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of it is timing and, and looking at, at your, your organization on a continuum because there will be people who uh, are very uncomfortable with technology or don't want to participate, don't understand the value, and you have to be an advocate for it, an advocate to those people. But I think it's really important to build partnership with people who are interested in working with you. And you can get, um, you can do projects, identify projects that you can do that will give you successes early on in your institution. And they might not be the most, you know, interesting or exciting projects or the most compelling, but if you can get examples of how digital media will improve the visitor experience, um, will make, you know, really bring value for people, that will get those museum um, workers who might not be very interested in these projects, it will give them um, exposure to it. Uh, and they will get to understand the projects and get to know them and get to see that they're really good and that they should be on board. So you can actually turn those grumpy people into advocates, but it takes time, and you can't convert everyone. There are some people that they're just, that's just the way they are. They might not really be interested, and it might not be their job, and that's okay. But I find from the work that I've done that for collaboration, you really have to think strategically, and you have to build partnerships, you have to build trust. And also, I think we take for granted that people are comfortable with technology and comfortable working on these kind of projects, and a lot of people are not. And, they, and, and with, with uh, digital humanities and digital media, you really need to experience it for yourself as a person, and, and it has to have value for you. And it's not gonna have value and meaning if you don't use it and it's not a part of your life. So these are all things we kind of take for granted, but when we work in museums, I think we have to pay more attention to these, these little things because they're about building relationships. And so that's kind of, uh, and it's been really great working at BPOC because I have had the opportunity to work with many institutions and they're all at different levels of being able to work collaboratively or some museums are really working in silos and others have really gotten it together and doing a great job uh, integrating technology across their institutions. So I'm really starting to see it um, 
you know, from a, a broader perspective and really where the different museums are in their process. This is really a process. Yes? Yes, hi, thank you uh, very much for the panel. Uh, my name is Charlene Haynes, I'm from Fordham. I wanted to ask uh, Christina, um, you said that you were moving now toward working with smaller groups in terms of they may have uh, photographic um, uh, archives, and these most of them were are voluntary groups or they're 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 small local groups. So how does that work in terms of the funding of it? They don't have the resources. Do you act as the lead for them? Do you actually construct the different proposals or the concepts or the summaries or or you know just how does that work? Because these organizations don't wouldn't have the resources. That's right. Well, in some of the organizations, the, some of the volunteers are actually um, savvy grant writers. Um, so we actually are, and we have a really fabulous grant writer. Our director of external affairs is, is really amazing. And so she's actually working um, in partnership with uh, several community organizations where we're applying for funding and, um, and different kinds of funding that would fund these kind of projects. So it's really a group effort between BPOC and these community organizations. And that's, that's how, we're, how we're doing it. And, so we're, and we're very excited about, about these partnerships. We have a question from Stephen Lubar. Hi, Stephen. It's about the relationship between museum collections and content management systems with the commons. Oh. Right? Yeah. Is that what you want to ask? Yeah. For Steve, about, um, he, we've been, he said we've been talking a lot about um, uh, collections access, but not so much about interpretation and the commons. And I thought that was a very prescient question. I think that's a great question. I would like to see our commons sites be, be spaces for, for interaction with museum staff where we see um, comments from people, we see their live editing of our chat our labels, our text. We see they're mixing and mashing our publications online that we, could, we see our space being basically as a wiki, something that can be editable, changed with a the, with the trail of activity, but so we actually see the online space as being a dynamic living space for democracy in exchange with our collections. I, I have sort of a, uh, a way of thinking, there's so, there's so many ways of talking about that question, Stephen, wherever you are in cyberspace. Uh, cyberspace, but um, I think the primary change I'm after is uh, to get knowledge, memory institutions to stop thinking about themselves as the owners of interpretation um, and stop thinking about themselves as, as needing to manufacture the entire ecosystem from s owning an object to studying it to cataloging it to deciding what questions need to be asked about it to answering those questions to developing products that explain the answers to the public and just pick one part of that ecosystem that they can be exceptionally good at and, and, and pick a part that allows more people in the world, so cognitive surplus, Joy's law, and Kathy Sierra's law, allows the most people in the world to have access to those raw materials, so to build on. I, th I think that's the, that's the primary thing, and we've been tweeting in the, the, the back channel and talking among ourselves that, um, um, well, I'll, I'll let that thought, that thought drift off. You know, we, do, we don't need to be the only, the public wants our expertise as memory institutions. They want it, they want our, our convening power, but they don't just want that. They also want the stuff to do their own things with. I think that's a, a one way I would begin attacking the question of using a commons to, to, for interpretation. Uh, yeah, the reason, the reason that I didn't talk about that is, is because <laughs> In the, inst in the ecosystem of the Walters Art Museum where I was working, that's just not where I could make a difference. I mean, I was a curator who, who, ha who had a vision to create Creative Commons data, and that was enough of a job. Uh, uh, the Walters does do fantastic things. Its web and social media is, is, is really wonderful. Uh, and uh, it's got 100,000 followers on Twitter, and you can get involved in it uh, uh, very easily, uh, and it does hugely innovative things 
including getting the public to crowdsource its exhibitions and that sort of thing. So, uh, so there's another aspect of the operation that I just wasn't part of the ecosystem for. I, I just learned from them. I wanted to add to Michael's comments by just stressing that I think our mission as museums is to serve publics, not products, and that our focus online every day should be to have meaningful interaction with our constituents. Just the, the build-up to this panel tonight has been so exciting to watch friends and colleagues from Australia, from Denmark, um, logging in tonight from Washington, D.C. area, joining this conversation on Twitter from New Mexico. There is a global audience. They're more than just an audience. They're people that are incredibly invested in your institution's well-being and future, and you should be doing your very best to engage with them every day. Yes. So I guess I want to follow up on that a little. Um, I'm very sympathetic with the fact with the, that notion of putting the information, the, the image with data out there as broadly as possible. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I'm also curious in any examples in which museums are actively co cooperating with um, humanities institutions uh, to you know, create symposia, to sort of consciously work together on a theme or a set of work. I mean, it's a bit like putting on an exhibition, the difference between observing the collection and then more consciously telling a story about a, a set of those. Um, are there any examples of a kind of um, yes. collaboration with institutions? The best example that comes to my mind right away is the Walters Art Museum and their exhibition, Public Property, where they had an online curation of works in the collection selected by the public also I think some some choices by the staff there there's a great documentation that Dylan Kennett who's the head of IT there has, has organized images of the ex physical exhibition the works online uh, the Brooklyn Museum has also done crowdsourced events and exhibitions uh, the Walt the Walker and the Minneapolis, I think the Minneapolis Institute of Arts also has done one so there's there's these projects sprouting up and I think in terms of symposium and conversations that's why I was really excited to have Matt working with us here tonight is to we're following our colleagues in digital humanities and literature studies and visualization and mathematics doing these exciting, amazing things. And I just kept seeing the parallels. We do very similar things. The University of Pennsylvania has books. Museums have books. The university collection has photographs. We have photographs. A library has stuff. We have stuff. It's the same stuff. And, and we have to start working more, I think, as Michael talked about, as GLAMS as kind of one big unit and, and seeing the connections across these things. And there was, a, if I can quickly say, that there was a wonderful question on Twitter about how museums and, and universities can work together. Uh, you know, we, we have similar stuff um, and we have similar interests. We also have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, university, university libraries, for example, are really good at managing data. And museums, generally speaking, unless they're really big, they're not terribly good at managing data. They're much better at managing pots. Um, in terms of the type of audience that you can bring to bear, uh, universities obviously have strength in undergraduate, graduate, st international students, that sort of thing. Um, and museums in small, in, in small cities have, ha have a general public. And, and it's not that one is better or, or than the other, it's just that they bring completely different things to the same stuff. Um, so if we can move as seamlessly as possible between museums and, uh, and, and university institutions, many of which have museums, uh, that's all to the good, I think. Can I add one more point of reference to that? I think um, the MIT OpenCourseWare has some great examples of what a lot of people call collaboration without control. So because they, which scales. So because they put resources out under a CC license, other people can do stuff that would previously have required a lot of hands-on collaboration, like with legal departments and yada yada, just never would have happened. And then those types of activities also have tended to generate the more familiar feeling hands-on, let's do a conference or let's do a research project or let's, you know, let's do a symposium kinds of things. So there seems to be a virtuous cycle that goes there. But I think the most interesting, uh, it's like the Willie Sutton law. Why do, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. You know, I think where the scale is, is in collaboration without control. But then there's also good stuff that happens as a result of it. Did I get that right, Willie Sutton? No, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> 
a little different question. If this is a very fascinating topic, and um, I wanted to say that first time I visited the Walters was about two years ago, and living in New York and visiting museums in New York, the Walters Museum is sublime. It's one of the best places I've ever been to view art. It's terrific for families. It inspires uh, a, a level of curiosity that I haven't quite experienced in other museums. Got to agree. And well, it's, it's just, you know, the children's section is very animated and lovely and upstairs the paint, it's just so well done. And I'm wondering if you've looked at all at um, how your digital collections and the digital sides are bringing people into that space. Because I like my Mac an awful lot too, but the experiences of looking at a manuscript on the Mac and seeing my favorite triptych in the Walters are completely different. And I would really want people to have that physical experience of being there and being with the objects and what that means as well. So who, who's looking at how to get people in there too and interacting with? Yeah, I, because I haven't gathered many statistics, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't probably give you the answer that you want. I'm convinced that the great danger that medieval manuscripts have, by the way, is not that they're becoming overused, but they're becoming irrelevant. And I do see the, uh, the digital revolution as fundamentally addressing that problem, whether people come to the original or not. In terms of, um, uh, uh, but I think they do. I, I think in, in answering your question more specifically, I can only think of one example that I have any kind of figures for. Um, until uh, August of 2011, about 200 people had seen the Archimedes Palimpsest uh, in real. Everybody else had seen it in digital. And we had an exhibition and we had about 20,000 people come to the show. And they only knew about it as a digital thing before then. And they loved the show. So I hope that's some answer. I have an example from when I used to work at the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, I worked on projects to create uh, video, videos on um, our exhibitions and our collections. And I worked with the contemporary art cur curators to do videos, artist interviews with um, artists who were coming to the museum and doing their installations. And we would videotape them doing their installations and we put them online. And the uh, curators became big advocates for the videos and digital media because they would have people come to the exhibition, come to Sam and say, you know, I really wouldn't have come to the Seattle Art Museum or come to this exhibition, but I saw this really great video online about the artist and I really wanted to see it. So curators who I thought really didn't see as advocates became advocates because they started to talk to uh, the, our visitors and find out the visitors were getting information about the art. And this was art that wasn't particularly accessible. Uh, contemporary art uh, that was, didn't have a lot of interpretation, didn't have a lot of doors in. And so this video created it. And the video also became viral. This was a couple years ago um, when um, um, art magazines and blogs would pick up the video. And these were shows that had no marketing budgets at all. And so curators would work with artists on these shows and they would worry if people would actually find the galleries and come and see the work. So here's where a real small effort to create video actually became a really strong marketing tool for getting people into the door that wouldn't necessarily come or know that we had this available or the museum had this available. And what would you say to the, uh, you know, the small collection that they're you know, is maybe not being seen as much and they're getting the pressure of saying, well, can't you just digitize that? Do you really, you do, do you really need the room in the gallery for that anymore? I think you always need the room in the gallery. I mean, you always need, need to show your stuff, but what, what the, the digital works can do is they can, they can at least get the word out that it's there. They can at least be the welcome committee. If you can't see it, if it's if it's locked in the vault and it's not going to come up for a while, you should at least pe let people know that you have it. Yeah, this is this is a fundamental semiotic problem, because 
because digital images can be made to look like, like real things, people think that they're the same. And they're not. They're completely different. I mean, you can't, you can't touch a digital image. You can't, you, a digital image has a history that uh, is, what, maximum 30 years old. Uh, you, there's, a, there's a lot that a dim, digital image cannot do, um, uh, especially when it's reproducing a historic artifact. I mean, it, you know, um, it can look beautiful, but it's not sublime. Um, and uh, in terms of evidence, uh, there's so much evidence in medieval manuscripts, which just happens to be the thing that's my obsession, that you can't possibly replicate in, in a digital image that, that you know, it's all the de details of the binding, all the qualities of the paper, all the issues of the parchment. I mean, you know, uh, it can't it can't be got, not really, and it's not gonna it's not gonna change. Um, so serious researchers need need to come and see the original uh, uh, if they if they if they really um, want to look at it in any any kind of traditional way. And uh, the public is just going to realize when it sees a digital image that um, it's got to go and it's got it's got to go and find out where that original is and what that original is and how fantastic that original is and that's why people go to the Mona Lisa. Um, you know, it's 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 pretty it's pretty obvious to me and and the and the and the problem right now. And the reason it's not obvious to other people is that they can't get it, they can't get it quite straight in their heads. But in 50 years' time, it's going to be totally obvious that the digital image and the real thing are completely they're just completely different things, and they're good for completely different things. Yeah, but <laughs> I agree with all that. But <laughs> let me go off for three breaths. I get irritated by the presumption that physical experiences are authentic and good and digital experiences are somehow inauthentic and not as good. Digital experiences, experiences intermediated by digital technology can be life-changing, sustaining, joyous, passionate, healing, teaching. Amen, Brother Edson. <laughs> um, so, I think that's important to keep in mind for the for the the vast vast proportions of humanity who will be able to get online even if on a crappy modem in a hotel parking lot in the developing world who want to expand their lives through the stuff that you keep locked in your vaults or hung on your walls. Well, I don't understand why it has to be an either or no. proposition. Really, we live in a culture now where we, where they support each other. They should support each other and work, work together. Yes, and Matt, I think, has some comment or question for us. Yes, I actually wanted to channel a question from the uh, Twitter sphere Great. that came Thanks, in Matt. much earlier. The stream has moved on. Yes. Um, but um, it actually deals with exactly this question, and it comes from P. Toko, and he says, um, all great stuff, but is DH all just about dissemination? And I think this refers to our conversations about getting um, images out there and, and getting people to come. How might these ideas transform physical presence? So one question we might ask based on this conversation that we've just had is how, how can these, the, this digital work begin to transform the physical encounter with the artwork? Um, I think I'd like to start with that, if that's all right. Um, one of the goals that I've, I've tried to articulate here tonight and in previous talks is that I really believe it's important for museums to have digital humanities centers within their institutions, to invite digital humanists to come in, scholars and the public, to work in these physical spaces and to edit Wikipedia articles together, to do visualizations together, to learn. So it's about the education space and it's also about um, taking these tools that we have, these, these really important digital tools, our mobile devices, our iPads, our laptops, and using them in the museum space, using them in Congress with the, with the works on site. And so we need resources to do that, we need the openness to do that. And basically what, it's, what it means is a change in scholarly paradigm. It means that scholars don't just sit in one office or don't just publish in one topic. It means that the public is a scholar, that they're all potentially scholars, that they're non-traditional scholars, and we have to allow their voices and participation. It also means that we build our publications, we build our tools. If, if one museum creates a great content management solution and we share that openly, 
So it's with our tools, it's with our publications, and our assets, and it's beyond dissemination. It's about that collaborative building process and allowing the same types of wonderful activities that we're seeing happen at unconferences like that camp, or at centers here at CUNY or at MYTH or at Center for New History and Media, that these models come into our, our museum institutions. I, I've, I've, been, I've worked with a number of museums during their construction and planning phases, and the, the typical uh, American museum tends to start really working on its website for reopening like three months before the reopening. You know, they'll spend five years and $500 million working on a physical bricks and mortar project and then, oh my God, we have to have a website. And it's, you know, it's three months late and, you know. And I've been really trying to get organizations to think about, you know, it's that think big, start small, move fast. What can you do tomorrow for your 2015 opening to begin building a movement around the ideas that you care about so that by the time your doors open, you've beta tested every idea you've had, every idea your, your audience and your super users and your fans have had, you open those doors knowing that there's a passionate, engaged community around the things and the outcomes you care about. I think that's the virtuous cycle of feedback between digital and actual. And Tim O'Reilly wrote recently in a, in a piece he put on LinkedIn, ideas are just tools for thinking new thoughts. And the best idea generating engine in the world is the internet. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's where you figure out what it is you need to do and how to influence the world. That's the blueprint that lets you build things that matter and last. <laughs>